Hi everyone and welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with the one and only Butler Schaefer. He's a professor at Southwestern Law School and a legend in the Liberty Movement. He's known everybody. He's written on just about everything. He's published four books, or actually more than four books. He's going to be talking about four of them here at uh, Liberty Me Live over the next uh, uh, two months. So well, tonight he's going to be talking on, on the topic of his book, Calculated Chaos. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay, we well, start off by saying a legend. I think it was really a legend in my own mind, and that that's the topic I wanted to talk about was the my first book, which I wrote as what I thought would probably be, uh, and, and I still regard as my my best book, most important one, and that has to do with the problem that we have in our culture not just with politics. And I think that most of us are very much concerned about uh, political systems and their restrictions on peace, liberty, and, and so forth. But it goes much deeper than that. <clears throat> and the problem, I think, stems from our willingness to identify ourselves with systems, organizations, <coughs> excuse me, that become institutions. And this comes about as a result of our willingness to identify ourselves with various groupings of people. We can group ourselves according to our race, religion, nationality, political system, where we went to school, whether we live in a city or out on the farm, whatever. There there are all kinds of ways in which we attach meaning to our lives by identifying ourselves with these various categories. And the problem with this is that these categories are then uh, taken over by uh, various institutions that claim to represent these categories, so that political systems claim to represent a nation, for example. Uh, churches claim to represent the uh, spiritual or religious searchings that individuals might have. Uh, corporations have taken over and start to run the whole system of economics, how we make a living, how we exchange with others, uh, etc. And so the problem is not just that we are is a repressed, held down, held back by political systems. It's that we identify ourselves with groups that political systems are then quite willing, quite eager to take over and become themselves. At this point, I think it's important to stress that there's a difference between just, say, an institution and an organization. We are, we are each of us is a very unique individual, our own DNA, etc. We're unique individuals. At the same time, we have a need for a social co cooperation with others. None of us today, none of us were it not for some level of cooperation with others. If it was just our mothers, you know, when we were born, our mother just dropped us along the side of the trail and walked on, uh, we wouldn't be here. So we require some kind of an organization. Family is one, one such organization. The marketplace is another kind of an organization that is a process by which we cooperate with one another without the organization becoming an end in itself. It's when the organization becomes an end in itself, its own reason for being, that we start developing the, the, the problems associated with institutions. The language that we see 
used today with regard to big corporations that are, quote, too big to fail, means basically that the corporation has become <clears throat> more important than the process by which economic activity normally is carried out. And so we become, become, we become subservient to that. <clears throat> and we become subservient not so much by virtue of the force that these organizations try to exert over us and do exert over us, but by our willingness to identify ourselves with these various systems. We identify ourselves with the nation state, you know, USA number one, USA number one, or with a religion. And whatever the religion is, uh, there's a tendency for many people to want to set up a system of conflict. You know, my religion is better than your religion, my God is better than your God, etc. Same in the area of, of learning with uh, business activities that we engage in. I remember attending a conference one time where a man introduced himself, said, I am Xerox. Now think about that. I am Xerox. Talk about having a sense of meaning and purpose in your life associated with a company that you work for. That's what I'm getting at with respect to the problems we get into with institutions. And institutions themselves have this very much of a unified interest in keeping us organized in really conflicting groups. And in part, this is just due to the way we think. And, and there's probably no way to avoid that. I mean, we think in terms of, of what the late Alan Watts used to call, is you is or is you ain't. Uh, whenever we're trying to find out about something in the world, we categorize them by things that fall into one category and everything else is outside that category. So we, we label some things as food, other things as non-food. Uh, and we do this in <clears throat> a variety of settings that because, because we have a difficult time disassociating ourselves from that. I mean, I am a male. There are many other people wandering around who are females. That's a fact. It's not just a sense of identity, but it becomes a question of, does it become important for us to be these things? Does it, does it become important to be a male or a female or black or white or an American or German or whatever the category may be? Um, when we start thinking that way, we're getting so tied in with the institutions that promote their interests through the conflicts that they can get us to generate with one another, then we have serious problems. And this is, this is what causes wars. Uh, it's, you know, it's the, it's the mindset of uh, George W. Bush. You know, if you're not with us, you're against us. And I think what we have to do is to be aware of the, these tendencies, to be aware that they come from within us something other people do to us. It's something that we kind of get dragged into that kind of thinking by people who have a vested interest in promoting the kinds of conflicts that institutions uh, thrive on. Political systems could not exist without conflict. And that's their, that's their very nature. Uh, if a political system that operated on the premise, we are going to do something that's going to help everybody in the world, everybody in our country, whatever it may be, uh, there would be nothing for it to do. This is like the old Chinese uh, fable of 
of a system where everyone was responsible for taking in everyone else's washing. Why? And yet that's, <clears throat> that's where we, that's really where we find ourselves. We, we get lined up in conflicts, <clears throat> excuse me, based upon uh, our race, for example, and based upon our nationality. And people who are of a different, who fit into a different category, uh, are not, not of us. And so therefore we're inclined to treat them differently. And they were willing to uh, be manipulated by the political systems in particular, because the political systems are the ones who really sort of made an art form out of this uh, terrible way of thinking. But can promote their anti getting us to one another. This is where war system begins. And you know, if, if we were without that, if we were without the war system, we would have, uh, you know, th there would be no conflict for the institutional order to want to moderate to their own ends. Now, I, I don't know at this end whether or not, at this particular point, whether or not uh, people would want to interject any questions or I could go into uh, specific forms of institutions. But the, the one point I want to emphasize, because people sometimes misconstrue what I'm saying. I am, I am not, I don't see a problem with organizations per se. I am not someone who advocates that we ought to go live off in a cave like some hermit or something like that. We need other people. We really do. Uh, all the, the things we're doing right now could not have been done by any of us individually. I, could, I couldn't have created a computer. I hardly know how to operate them sometimes. But I couldn't have created this. Uh, I couldn't have created a means by which the things I write get published. I couldn't do that. Uh, it's like the wonderful story that Leonard Reed put together called I Pencil. You know, the life of a pencil is put together by a lot of decisions that people who don't know one another, don't care about one another, but who are engaged in the production of wood and of rubber and of graphite and, you know, metals and things of this sort manage to sell their produce to one another. And one of the people who buys a lot of this is someone who's in the business of manufacturing pencils. It's none of it is planned. And this is the kind of organization I think that we, uh, we really need to figure out how to get back to that, how to get to that kind of, of thinking, to get away from this kind of e pluribus unum Collective thinking, you know, that we are all part of one big, one big collective, and instead to start insisting upon our individuality and to recognize that what we have in common is really a need to defend and respect one another's individuality. It's not a matter of, of balancing one person's interest against another. It's a matter of recognizing that I have an interest in protecting your liberty and your peace and so forth uh, in order that mine will also be respected. And we may, we may be getting back to that kind of an understanding, but it has to begin with a recognition. We are social beings. We are social creatures. We are also unique individuals, and there's no conflict with that. There's no necessary conflict with that. We can turn it into conflict by deciding to associate ourselves with a particular group, and somebody else is going to associate themselves with another group, and then in come institutional interests, particularly political ones, to start a fight. Let's you and him fight, <clears throat> and we will, we will set up the rules for the fight we will moderate the fight. We will umpire it. We will change the rules uh, accordingly. 
but the but the understanding is you guys are going to keep on fighting and we've got we've got to become aware that that's what we're doing you know it's not the politicians that are doing this they're just taking advantage of what we've created in our own minds oh anyone did, would anyone have any questions they'd want to bring up at this time or should i keep babbling One question here from Libertarius: uh, What would happen with all the all of the state institution, for example, if uh, minimum government, like a, I guess a state, was suddenly instituted? I know that one option is uh, selling off, but what if the richest buy everything? Then they will just have monopoly. One thing we have to keep in mind when we're talking about political systems, all political systems are defined. Uh, ask any political science professor, they will agree with this definition. I think, it, I think it originated with Max Weber, but I could be wrong on that. But in any event, political system is any entity that enjoys a legal monopoly on the use of violence within a given territory. And this is part of the problem that's going on in well in this country in particular where you, you see some of the uh recent events down in ferguson missouri they've now been transferred back to new york city but where the, the question arises of whether police officers should be subject to some kind of restraint some kind of limitation on power uh, i don't think they can not that they shouldn't I don't think that they can, because if you operate on the premise that you enjoy a legal monopoly on the use of violence, and then you say, but there are limitations to that, somebody has to set the limitations. Somebody has to superintend that. Who's going to superintend that? Whoever that person is, is going to be someone sort of the super monopolist on violence. They're going to say, we have the power to ride herd on your behavior. And I think as long as you have a political system defined as a, with a, as having a monopoly on the use of, of violence, I don't see how they can, how they can avoid getting to the place where they have to say at some point, our will is law. That's it. You just have to put up with it. So in any event, uh, I'm asked the question, well, if we didn't have political systems, I may be paraphrasing this or re doing it incorrectly in terms of the question being asked. But in the absence of political systems, how would certain things be done? How would roads be built, parks created, maintained, schools and on and on, fire department, et cetera? And I can tell you, I mean, I, the first time I ran into this question was when I first began to really learn economics. And that was when I was in law school at the University of Chicago. And I had a professor, uh, Aaron Director, who created the law and economics idea that is now used in many law schools. And I remember one of the students asked a question and Aaron said, well, any activity that either has been or can be performed by political systems either has been or can be performed in the marketplace. And of course, this just sent most of my classmates into a tizzy, you know, oh, no, you can't. At some point, you know, you have to have this minimal amount of authority, police and fire and so forth. Well, when people ask me questions of this sort, I usually respond by saying, I don't, I don't know. How will things be done in a free society of 7 billion people on the planet uh, in the absence of political systems? How will all this be taken care of? I do have great confidence 
that people can exercise, can pursue their own self-interest. I think, and this is one of the points that Aaron Director always made, you know, if people really have an interest in having highways or parks or a library or a school or whatever, they can out peaceful ways of producing it. Now, sometimes we don't like that because that puts upon us the costs of bringing that into effect. And we're, we are great. Humans are great at wanting to uh, impose the costs of our actions on others. Uh, the economists have a perfect word for it. It's called socializing the costs. I want all of the benefits program, but you guys pay us. You pay, you pay for the football for the baseball stadium that I want the team play in. You pay to build the factory. You pay for this or pay for that because these are costs, and we would rather someone else incur those costs than us. But you can do it. If people really want to accomplish something uh, and they are willing to commit their own resources to it, I suppose you could say you could do whatever is physically possible to do. I don't suppose you could, you know, say the laws of gravity forth without consequences. But I don't know. I, I And I don't think it's important to know. It's kind of like people asking, you know, if you're a supporter of the scientific method, well, tell me what's the cure for cancer going to be. I don't know. I have great confidence in the processes by which we can work these things out. And what will probably work out, I would guess, in a, in a broad social system, is there going to be a lot of different people doing a lot of different things from which the rest of us can learn. Who put all this stuff together? Who, who created computers? Who created this computerized technology? It's interesting that it was actually created by whom? The government. <laughs> Most people aren't aware of that. What I call war, the, the Defense Department, I call, <clears throat> call them the War Department because that's what they were called when I was a kid. But they created this as sort of a sub rosa system to communicate with another in the case of some catastrophe. Well, a few sharp people figured out, well, we can crack into that and make use of the Internet as well, and away it went. So there are going to be a lot of different people doing a lot of different things that are going to leave the rest of us sitting around wondering, why didn't I think of that? I don't know if that answers the question, but if you think, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, you're talking about institutions and organizations, and that vocabulary certainly calls to mind uh, the work of the new institutional economists and historians. Now, are you using those words the same way they do, as in uh, uh, institution being the rules of the game and the organizations being uh, more like the teams? Not necessarily that, I because there's a, some very subtle points that arise here when you're talking about distinguishing organizations, which are common to us. These, this is the way we live. We are organizing people. We are social people. But when the organizations we create, and particularly if they've been successful, Let's say we create some kind of a way of doing things that really works, and we're just so much in love with it that we that we attach ourselves to it, but we think we have a vested interest in keeping that system going. You know, if if a way of manuf manufacturing widgets really works, and we have having widgets. Gosh, maybe we'd better keep the widget manufacturers in business or the car manufacturers or whoever it might be. But too often we spend our time wanting to protect the systems that we create rather than protecting the processes by which the systems got created. And who it was who said, and there's a great line, I've got to appreciate it. 
the, one of the worst things, one of the, one of the most things we have to do is to continue to repeat our successes. When we <clears throat> get our into a particular way of doing things. So this is really one of which civilizations have come to an end. I can read uh, historians, you know, the uh, Will and Ariel Durant, uh, Carol Quigley, uh, you know, Burkhart, uh, others like this. You see this common theme theme running through a lot of their works, and that is that civilizations begin to collapse when we start structuring things. When we want to keep things the way they are, uh, Quigley probably did the, the the best job on that, saying that we try to. Well, how did he word that? Basically, we want to structure the systems that have created the values upon which that civilization depend, rather than wanting to maintain the process. One saw this, for example, when were being threatened with just basically their their existence. You know, they just couldn't function anymore. And car manufacturers would be a good example. At least in this, I remember being asked, "What do you think? What do you think should happen to people like Chrysler, for example, if they can't remain competitive? Well, then they should be allowed to go out of business. But when we attach ourselves to institutions when they become too big to fail, when we can't think of living without them, when we can't think of living without the United States of America or the Presbyterian Church or you know, Yale University or whatever, then we start repressing, we start destroying the foundations that created these systems in the first place. And that's what we've done. I mean, this is what we've done. This is why Western civilization is now a matter of history. Years ago, I used to <laughs> tell people, you know, the day is going to come when civilization is, is going to erode away unless, unless we change some of our thinking. Well, we didn't change the thinking. Western civilization is dead. It's, it's finished. Uh, I am encouraged by the fact that there are so many alternative ways of doing things. We're living in a world that is becoming increasingly decentralized. I think we're in, in, a, in a, a period where we may be on the verge of a fundamentally different civilization. I'm just finishing a book now called the uh, the unfolding civilization. It's kind of an extension of what happened after Gutenberg <clears throat> upset the institutional order by creating his system of movable type. And now all of a sudden information was more widely spread throughout a culture. Well, think where we are now. Not just with the internet, that's, that's part of it. <clears throat> That's the most uh, most obvious part of it, but the nature of a technology, and I don't think it's really really set in even amongst the people who are some of the most avid supporters of computer technology and the and the internet. But we now have the physical capacity. Each one of us. You, I, others have the physical capacity to correct, to communicate with every single human being on this planet, provided two things exist. One, each of these other people has a computer that is connected up with the internet. And number two, they're interested in communicating with us. It may be we've got nothing to offer them, so that won't happen. But we have the capacity for that. And there's nothing like the free flow of information to 
generate creative consequences. My kids, my grandkids are, I think, going to find themselves in a very creative world because of what's going on. Right now, it's, it, it's pretty ugly. The institutional order is still insisting upon its control. But in the long run, I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I am too. Uh, now our next question is from Travis Cochran. He asks, uh, you know, your books brilliantly illuminate the historical partnership between big business and big government. You're loved among left li amongst left libertarians like Kevin Carson, David D'Amato, and myself. And parts of your analysis remind me a little of uh, Gabriel Coco. Who, in your opinion, wields wield more power, uh, big business or government? Or does one become the other through this collusion? That's the last half of that again, because I was... There, the sound kind of went out. Um, Colton, who, in your opinion, uh, wields more power, big business or big government, or does one become the other through this collusion? Well, I think they basically become, because Noam Chomsky refers to, and I think correctly so, is that it's, you know, the owners, the owners of the corporate system, the big corporations, and the, the government basically are, are really, you know, very much indistinguishable. I, I became very, very interested in this uh, work here. I ran, ran across a, a book written by some lawyer that was being very defensive of laws and so forth, not had any use for antitrust laws. So I just sat down and off the top of my head just wrote about a six or seven page reply to this guy. And this was back in, no, I don't know, it was 1963. And sent it off to him, and I thought, well, I'll send a copy of it to Rothbard. I hadn't met Rothbard by that time, but uh, I knew of him and knew how to communicate with him, so I sent him a copy of this. And, by the way, you know, you know, Murray was maybe one of the greatest <laughs> communicators in this whole libertarian movement. But he came back right away with a letter and said, ah, you've got to, you've got to read Gabriel Coco. He came out with a wonderful book called um, Triumph of Conservatism. Told me a little bit about it. Coco was a socialist uh, uh, by his own admission. I mean, he's not, I'm not slandering the guy. <clears throat> but he went through in his book the, the, the history of, where so much government regulation had come from, antitrust laws and so forth, so forth. They came about not from people going off to Congress to uh, enact to help the little as the big corporations were just running a rough shot over them. That, that's a kind of bunk we got in high school civics classes uh, and usually repeated in college courses as well. And sad to say sometimes in law schools, uh, very often in law schools. But I started reading uh, Coco and Weinstein and uh, Ellis Hawley and a whole lot of other people. Um, most of them were from the libertarian left. And some of them, I remember there was a story told about, about uh, Coco when he found out that of free market libertarian economists were very interested in his work. He he got angry. It was like he was trying to figure out some way, to, some way to sue us all. You know, it's like you can't do that. You know, you got to be a socialist to do that. Well, that wasn't that wasn't the case. I mean, the, they were right, and uh, they provided a lot of the the the, the groundwork that led a lot, the rest of us to inquire into that. Further. I don't think there's any question about that anymore. I don't, I don't, very many people who really think, you know, the uh, political system, people go off to Washington in order to serve and protect the little guy. They don't. I mean, look at the numbers of people who end up in politics who make millions. Of, what is it? The 10, the 10, most 
well, the 10 wealthiest counties in America, I think something like six of them are right around Washington, D.C. Gee, I wonder how that happened. But, uh, yeah, it, it's all you have to do is be willing to, to, to take a look at this and you, you discover, you yeah, know, this is, it's a racket. If you think, if you think of all, not just politics, but think of institutionalism generally. I think every institution is a racket. I said that someplace in my Calculated Chaos book. But it is. It, it appeals to something we have a sense of a need for, and we get something different. I, I think all of us have a need for what I would call spiritual or religious experiences. I mean those with a small s or a small r. I'm not talking about churches. I agree with Carl Jung, who once said that people have this need for spirituality, but that churches are probably the last place you're going to, going to satisfy that. Um, but they, they appealed, appealed to the step, but instead of offering explore, exploration, which is what I think the need for spirituality is about, they offer dogmas, doctrines, believe this or else. If you don't, well, we've got steak out here ready to burn you at if need be. And the same is true with business organizations. You know, once they get started, and this was one of the things I got into with my, my next book, was uh, the book called In Restraint of Trade, which documents uh, the business businesses war against competition from 1918 to 1938 how the emergence out of world war one with the war industries board uh, continued to provide uh, Uh, Travis, who asked our last question, says, also, I graduated from USC and I live in LA and I would love to stop by your class one day and sit in with, if that's okay with you. Would that be all right?
It is. Show it. Our next question is from Wesley. He asks, is it just a matter of education or do we have to actually demonstrate our ability to survive and thrive out outside of institutions? We, we don't absorb all, all of the costs associated with our actions. We've fragmented ourselves into situations where if it doesn't work out, somebody else will cover for us. It might be an insurance company, it might be the political system, it might be somebody else. And, and we really need to learn to be existentially independent. I don't mean by that to be a sort of self-sustaining in a way in which a lot of people think, well, every country should be self-sustaining of its own economic needs. Nonsense. You, you do much, much better by learning how to uh, trade your surpluses and from those areas in which you are best able to to produce. If I'm a better if I'm a better wheat producer than you are, but I'm also a better corn producer than you are, should I try to be both a wheat and corn producer? And you're really your best talent, let's say, might be that of being a corn producer. Oh uh, what what would be a sensible way for us to function? I would focus on raising wheat. You would focus on raising corn. Uh, rather than my trying to become productively independent of everyone else. I couldn't do that. There are too many things that I might want that I find of interest to have that make my life function well that I could probably learn how to make a computer. I don't know that I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> I want to work on other things that, and then with people who have the skill to produce that I want. So I don't know if that answers a question, but 
I don't think I don't think those two purposes are at odds with each other. I think it's a matter of I wouldn't say education. I I'm not a great fan of education. I tell my students the first day of class, I'm not I'm not here to educate. I tried I tried teaching years ago when I first first got into this field and found it was very you know very unproductive. I didn't I didn't did not enjoy teaching. So what I decided to do was to create environments in which I would present cases and materials and questions and hypotheticals to students, and then they would go about the task of teaching themselves. In other words, I see my job as helping other people learn how to think, not teaching them what to think. And I think if you figure out from your own perspective how to think, you'll work these you'll work these questions out on your own. My favorite all-time professor of anything was Malcolm Sharp, one of my professors in law school. And he was a master of the Socratic method. He wouldn't give you an answer to anything. You ask him what time is it, his response would be, well, do you mean clock time? You're talking about cosmic time, psychological time. What do you mean? Well, I just mean clock time. Well, okay. Is there someplace else you need to be rather than where you are right now? Some something else you, that's more important that's pressing upon you. And if so, what would that be? And why were why is that more important than what you're doing right now? Everything was just this this whole process. Through him, you know, you learned that the important aspects of learning are to constantly improve the quality of your questions. You go deeper and deeper and deeper into the kinds of questions that you ask. Pretty soon you get to the place where questions start to answer themselves. Whereas Milton Mayer once said, the questions that can be answered aren't worth asking. It's the questions that gnaw at you just eat away at you you know say well if i don't do this what's the other way of doing it and you play with that and play with that some of the most important things I learned in, in my lifetime was in a period of about two to three years i was undergoing a, a lot of introspection i graduated from law school i was what i wanted to do because no time to during or after law school, did I ever want to pursue law? It was just I, I did it for the learning, the experience. And sometime after that, I started. Well, my my first job was actually a political job. I admit that, but that's that's well, that was up to seven years ago. Uh, and at a time, I still thought. Well, you know, maybe, maybe the political process can resolve some of these problems. I, I was quickly learning that it did not. I, I learned very quickly from my experience at work that political action is a waste of time, unless you're just in it for ego or money-making satisfaction. But I was going through that, and at the same time, I was taking some taped uh, courses uh, put on by the Nathaniel Brandon Institute on the philosophy of Ayn Rand. And while this was going on, I was also taking a, a graduate course in Marxism uh, from a man who at the time was regarded as the most highly respected Marxist philosopher in the world. And I might add, a very he was good. And I was also going through work with, I've become familiar with the works of uh, Robert Lefay, who at the time had the Freedom School out in college. So all this is going 
going on at the same time and talk about you know the boiling pot <laughs> really really play, played out i i so much from ayn rand uh because she few to confront these issues at a much deeper level than just at some political political superficial level so much so that I basically rejected her main her main points. I, you know, it, it was help, help very helpful to have gotten into all of that kind of turmoil, if you will, and, and you really couldn't nurse on it. But when it was over and done with, you know, I, I I'm sorry, but I can't I cannot upset, accept <laughs> the idea that that we can think objectively about things, about anything. All, all, all understanding of the world is subjective. It's based upon my prior experience. It's based upon a lot of other things, things, things that I have been taught, things people have told me. Maybe some, something that comes out of collective unconsciousness. But this, this is why economics appeals to me so because it's premised on the idea of the subjective valuation and so to me everything i know about the world is a matter of opinion and there's something very liberating about that you then find yourself in a situation where you're not being self-righteous toward others you don't feel a need to coerce others into accepting your point of view it's, it is quite quite liberating to be have some sense of wholeness within yourself that you can use as your marker, so to speak. Now, uh, back on on the subjects uh, of uh, institutions, uh, oh. so uh, the law and economics. I, I, I've lost you. Uh, I've you lost you. I can now. Yes. Okay, uh, back on the on the subject of uh, institutions. Now, some of the the law and ethics uh, faculty that I guess you studied under at the University of Chicago, as well as uh, some of the new institutional uh, types, will will say that uh, institutions exist to minimize conflict. Uh, these monopolistic institutions uh, exist in order to minimize conflict between individuals and uh, maximize, uh, I guess, the uh, capturing of the gains from trade. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that seems like a stark contrast to your view that these institutions it, it, are <laughs> create the conflict. There are a lot of people who do say that. You're, you're quite right. The question is, are they, are they correct? Well, if you get into an examination of the way in which institutions behave, and keep in mind, Many there are many people out there, and I I, I understand this. You you develop an attachment to these things just out of interest. You know if if I have an employer, if an employer is paying me five hundred thousand dollars to uh, per particular point of view, um, there's a lot of pressure on me to identify with that point of view, isn't there? If I'm interested in more interested in making money than in pursuing what's true. And, or at least pursuing what I believe to be true, what my subjective preferences tell me is true. And so I understand a lot of the people who just don't want to get all that position. Uh, but that doesn't change what's going on. There's 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 a there's a dispute amongst a lot of us economic revisionists as to whether or not these governmental agencies were created by at the at the behest of business interests working with the government to create these agencies of, of monopolization or whether they were simply captured. In other words, that 
the agency was there and people who are regulated by it decided, I want to capture that so, so to make it do what I want it to do. For the life of me, I can't figure out the logic of how one of these institutions, one of these agencies would have been created in the first place. Who would have found it in their self-interest to create a Federal Communications Commission or an Interstate Commerce Commission? Would, would someone just say, well, let's, let's go out and set up a drug administration or an SEC or whatever it is? Who, who would have the incentive to do that? Other than if we operate from, an, say, an Austrian point of view, people are acting to pursue their self-interest, people who would find it to their self-interest to have such systems in place. Who, would, who might find it in their self-interest to do that? Who would find it in their self-interest to create an agency that's going to restrain your competitors from doing things that might be detrimental to your interests. You might do that. And it's, uh, the more you start playing around with that, it's what the Romans used to call the cui bono principle. Murray Rothbard was good on that. You know, he, when something strange, bad would happen, up came the cui bono principle. Who benefits? Uh, somebody assassinated a Roman leader, the first question was, we won't know who benefited from this. That's who did it, but that's the first place you start. Same way if, if someone's spouse is murdered, guess who the police are going to come check on first? You. <laughs> you know, not that you did it, that doesn't mean that you did it, but they're more likely to find a suspect in that situation than they are just confronting some homeless guy up in Pawtucket, Rhode Island or someplace. You know? it's, it's a self-interest principle again. And so you go back and start looking at how all of this structuring came about, which is part of what I had done in my in restrictor trade book. And the nice thing about it is these guys lay it out for you. They, many of them were very open about this. We we deserve more of a return on our investment than we're getting, and we're going to go to Congress and see if that can happen. They say they don't say it now. Now they say, you know the. Oops, I think we. Are you still there? I'm still here. Can you... I can hear you, but I'm looking at a, a screen full of of leaves. But as long as do you do you see me? I can see you. That's good enough. Uh, uh, oh, Brittany is. <laughs> I guess we can go on talking while she's making the adjustment yeah. here. But self interest is it's one of the one of the ongoing debates I have with a few people, one of my colleagues out at the law school, is convinced there's such a thing as altruism. I said, give me an example. Make one up if you choose to do so. I can't imagine anyone acting in the pursuit of a lower self-interest, you know, to sacrifice something that's more to their self-interest and in favor of something less. Why would people do this? Why do people jump into a raging river to save a drowning dog? It's nice that they do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not knocking the act. I mean, what I'm saying is that <clears throat> someone <clears throat> excuse me, does this because it's their self-interest self <clears throat> to see this dog rescued or a child or whoever it might be. You know, it reinforces this idea that life really does value other life. We really do. And when we see life threatened in some fashion, even if it's a stranger, uh, we're inclined to want to act to protect it, even at great risk to ourselves. 
but it's that sense of self-interest. You know, I, <clears throat> I've often used the example, when I was a teenager, my self-interest largely consisted of me. I mean, that's kind of the way we are as, as teenagers. And then I got a little older. I met a woman who became my wife, and then we, the, my self-interest became the two of us. And we started having children, and my self-interest incorporated uh, the children. And in time, they got married. Married, my self-interest included their families, and then they started having children, and so the, my self-interest included my grandchildren. I've got a whole bunch of people out there who are every bit as much a part of my self-interest as I was when I was a teenager. <clears throat> I, I don't make any, any distinctions there. And so the idea that I might pursue something that on the surface looks like it's you're sacrificing yourself for something really isn't i think a lot of this comes from the sort of thinking that rand got into you know that altruism kind of premised on the idea well i wouldn't have done that so if you would do that uh you must be an altruist because we have objective values we don't have objective values our values are also by nature, and all one needs really needs to do to confirm it, just to study economics at some point. The things that you value in the market, things I value in the marketplace, are going to be different. And in fact, it's only because they're different that exchanges can take place. You're a car, you're a car, a car dealer, and you're you you sell uh, have a wonderful car. The uh, the Rolls Canardly automobile, you know about that. It's a wonderful car. Rolls down one hill and Canardly make it up the next. But yeah, the Rolls Canardly automobile, and you're you're proposing to sell it for for twenty thousand dollars. I would like like to buy it for say fifteen thousand dollars.
Um, we, due to the connection, we lost last sentence. What was just that last sentence that you said? One of my favorite t-shirts is uh, one that the Students for Liberty just put out this year. It says on the front, don't tread on anyone. I think that that's Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up due to time reasons. But I want to thank you so much. I mean, this has been just tremendously interesting and enlightening, and I'm I'm so glad that we get to have you back uh, at least three more times. So uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we'll have I back. Uh, he's gonna be talking about uh, the topic of his book uh, in of trade on at 8 p.m. Eastern and uh, yeah. definitely check that out. We've also got some, some other great stuff coming up in the next week here at Liberty Me Live. Sunday night we've got Jeffrey Tucker continuing his Liberty Classic series with uh, Frank Chodorov's uh, great uh, oh, the, the book name is escaping me. Chodorov was Chodorov was one of my favorites. He, I forget he he spoke out at Rampart College one time, Bob Lefebvre's school out there, and he made this wonderful comment that I've cited many a time about conservatives. He said the trouble with you conservatives, you want to clean up the whorehouse but keep the business intact. And, <laughs> That that so much for you know political action. <laughs> well, we we need to learn how to walk away, from, how to walk away from this it stuff. Was, mm -hmm. It was his uh the rise the rise and fall of society. Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. On Tuesday night, Tuesday night we've actually got uh, David Friedman coming. He's going to be talking uh, something a little different than what he usually talks about. He'll be talking about his uh, his novels. Uh, he's got two novels, Harald and Salamander. And I, I'm uh, midway through Harald right now, trying to finish it before Tuesday. But it's been excellent so far. I highly recommend it. 
and he's always willing to answer questions about just about anything. So definitely check him out Tuesday night. Wednesday, we've got Dan D'Amico and Nathan Goodman uh, with their host, uh, Zoe uh, Little from uh, Students for Liberty. They're doing their SFL on-air broadcast. So definitely check them out next week. Hope to see you all back. And I uh, hope to see you all back in two weeks for more of Butler Shaver. Thanks so much. Yeah, this, it, well, it's, it's fun. It really is. This is one thing I have found over the years that, that most people really enjoy doing, and that is helping other people learn. Whenever I have asked somebody to come into a classroom, somebody who might be very busy, come into a classroom and talk about something, they're always willing to do it. And I think that we have this need as part of our social need to help others learn. Thank you so much. I know I've learned well, thank you. tonight. Hope everyone else has too. Uh, one more note for the audience. Uh, normally, we're, we're supposed to have a class in three minutes uh, with Zach Slayback back on the moral psychology of politics. Unfortunately, he just uh, got in touch with me. He had to cancel at the last minute. He's traveling and had some... Uh, had some issues with that, so uh, we're not going to have that tonight, but he'll be back with us next week. So, hope to see you there. Take care, everyone, and have a great night. Have a great night, Butler. Thank you.